Maternal and Infant Health series. Um, this is the Maternal and Infant Health series, and our presenter today is Dr. Cresta Jones. The topic for the day is prenatal substance use and state law, a Minnesota primer, and a little bit about um, Wayside Recovery Center. So um, we are a gender specific care. Um, we provide gender specific care for substance use disorder. Um, and Wayside has been in existence for over 60 years. We specialize in empowering women and breaking generational cycles of substance use. And as a federally certified community behavioral health clinic, Wayside now provides services to address whole health that are more affordable and more accessible. Um, so Wayside Recovery Center is hosting a Project ECHO um, series in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Human Services, focusing on reducing maternal and infant health disparities. Um, a little bit about our presenter, and then I'll pass it over. Um, Cresta, Dr. Cresta Jones is a physician at the University of Minnesota Medicine School, working in maternal fetal medicine and high-risk obstetrics, sorry about that, as well as prenatal addiction medicine. She has over 13 years of clinical and research experience examining best practices for the identification and treatment of pregnant um, people experiencing substance use disorder, and her current research includes examination of inequities related to substance use screening and pregnancy. Um, so I will pass it to Dr. Cresta Jones, and then um, later on we will take uh, have some time for a quick Q and A before we wrap things up. Well, thank you so much, Zora, and um, I'll keep the chat open too. So if there's any technical issues or people are having trouble hearing me along the way, um, please let me know. I'm uh, really appreciative of this opportunity to present. I think um, some some questions and clarifications that really have have we've been talking about a lot um, in Minnesota for a while now. Um, so my disclosures are that I have no financial disclosures related to my presentation today. Um, I also want to disclose that I am not an attorney, but I will be talking about both Minnesota and a little bit of federal statute. I have had the opportunity to work with our system lawyers along the way, but I do want to um, give that. Um, call out specifically. And I also want to apologize if I have to stop to clear my throat or cough because I am on the tail end of a um, breakthrough COVID case. So uh, many apologies for sometimes a little bit of ir irritating <laughs> voice sounding today. Um, so, all right, let's see. So here's kind of the objectives that I want to go over today. And I am going to kind of talk quickly and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end, but I wanted to make sure I got through um, all of this information, and there's a, a fair amount, um, really looking at um, specifically focusing on the recent Minnesota statute change that's related to perinatal substance use screening um, and re substance use reporting, to talk a little bit about other statutes here in Minnesota that are related to really perinatal substance use in general, um, and then just talk a little bit about um, some federal statutes that come up along the way as we discuss Minnesota laws, and then just start to open the discussion or, or highlight questions related to perinatal substance use, screening, testing, um, and health inequities in care. So I just put this up for everyone to take a look at. I think, you know, obviously Wayside is an, does an amazing job with our uh, patients and families, and I think a lot of you are very familiar with the importance of language uh, when we're working um, with patients who experience substance use disorders, but I just always like to start with just sort of a, a discussion of some of the language that we should lead with, um, especially as we continue to break down uh, stigma and bias um, in this treatment area. Um, I also want to call out specifically person-centered language. This is something that's um, a little bit newer um, in the perinatal substance use treatment sphere, if you will, but really it's important to remember that not all women, or not all people, now I already <laughs> made a mistake there, I apologize for that, so not all people who give birth actually identify as either women or mothers. Um, and so what I'm really trying to do a better job of is use, utilizing inclusive and person-centered language, um, acknowledging that words like maternal really don't have an acceptable alternative. So you will hear me use things like maternal um, during some of the discussion about perinatal health events. 
So I just want to start really quickly um, with the case because I think it's always important to consider the narrative from multiple perspectives. And so this is kind of the case I would get if a resident or a fellow comes in and says, you know, I have a 32 year old second pregnancy. They're here for their first OB visit. You know, during screening, we report, you know, she reports daily opioid use. She's really using pills that aren't hers. Um, so I talked to her as the resident kind of telling me, you know, I talked to her about the effects on the pregnancy, the effects on her overall health. And I said, you know, you really need to get into treatment. The patient told me she can't go into treatment. She said she's going to stop using on her own. Um, and so I told her, you know, the Minnesota law says I have to call your, the county that you live in and make a report because you really need to be in treatment. And then the resident says, you know, I'm, I'm really worried that the patient is, doesn't understand what I'm trying to tell her. And as the resident is telling me about the case, the nurse comes in and says, you know, the patient is really upset. I don't know what happened during your discussion, but she's actually left and she didn't make any more appointments. And so this is often sort of that really short narrative that you'll see either in a patient's visit, there'll be, you know, language about noncompliance or refuses or doesn't understand. And, and so I think that just sort of thinking when you read something in the medical record or you hear a description to, to really think about the perspective behind that. And so if we look at this from the patient perspective, from this same individual, um, you know, she's a 32-year-old mom to a wonderful five-year-old son and she's working full-time. She's felt kind of unwell for about a month. She's finally able to get to the store. She's got to you know, get to CVS, pick up a pregnancy test, and it's positive. She spends 20 minutes on the phone during a lunch break trying to get in for an OB visit. So she's already lost this time. She gets a visit, but it isn't for six more weeks. Um, she's been using opioids, really mostly, you know, loaning um, friends for, pills from friends, sometimes buying them. But um, it's gotten to the point where, you know, she really needs to take them every day or she does not feel well. And it's getting really expensive. And so she knows she needs to start looking at treatment options, but doesn't really know where she's supposed to start. She knows that she has insurance through a provider. She thinks it covers this kind of treatment, but she's not sure. And quite honestly, she's just scared if, if she calls the human resources, what's going to happen? Is she going to be treated differently? Is something going to happen with her job? And so just sort of in a scary position, um, you know, she gets to the office. She's really scared. She's nervous. She doesn't feel well. She's early pregnant. She hasn't taken any opioids recently. And, and when she meets first the nurse practitioner and, and then the resident, they, they seem really welcoming and non-judgmental. And, you know, she decides, I really need to let them know what's going on. I really need to get some help. And so she tells us about the opioids and says, you know what, I'm thinking I'm, I might need to, to maybe get some help to, to help cut down on this. Um, and then the caregivers, that the providers that she's seeing say, you know, you really need to stop using these pills. You're harming your baby. Um, and we need to report you to Hennepin County Social Services right away because if you don't get into treatment, I mean, you're not going to be able to parent. Somebody might take your baby away. And this, and this patient knows. She knows she's a good patient parent. She does a great job with her five-year-old son. He's supported. He's healthy. He's safe. He's meeting all his milestones. And she just needs a little bit more time to get into treatment. And so she's thinking, all right, I'm going to have to ask off of work. This is going to be really awkward. How's that going to happen? Um, and then the team tells her, you know, Hennepin County is going to be calling you. You really need to get into treatment. You have to find something that's going to work for you. And, you know, if you can't do this for yourself or for your baby, we're going to have to put you on a hold and, and we're going to have to make you go into treatment. And this patient just is so frustrated. Why did I share this? I really thought that these, you know, these individuals would help me and walks out without scheduling another visit. And I think for those who may not kind of work in that clinical venue, the question always comes up, does this really happen? It happens all the time. Um, and I think we always want to start by avoiding misconceptions when we interact with individuals who are pregnant who have substance use or substance use disorders, that just because they have ongoing non-prescribed drug use, it does not mean that they don't want to quit using drugs. And I think that's often a, a misconception that this is a decision or it's a, a selfish you know, choice. And, and that's just simply not the case. Insurance coverage may be limited for substance abuse treatment. You may have to go through a lot of hoops for pre-authorization. You may not even know who to call to find out. Um, and often, and especially in the pandemic, treatment had very limited space and, and couldn't accommodate work. You know, our clinic doesn't have after work hours. Our clinic didn't allow children in because of, of COVID. Um, and so really isn't necessarily as person-centered as we would like it to be. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, so I just want to, you know, I think these are things that all of us are familiar with that during the course of the last year and a half, um, we've reached record highs in um, overdose dose, um, primarily related to opioids, but with other substances as well. Um, and this is just a nice graphic from the Washington Post. And if you look at the far right, we see that, you know, overdoses had gone up significantly and finally started to downtrend around 2018. And then as we came into the pandemic, we just saw an exponential increase in overdose deaths again. And this did not, Minnesota wasn't protected from this. So these um, individual state data show that we had um, a 38% increase over the course of the pandemic. So from April 2020 to April 2021 um, in drug overdose deaths. So certainly um, something to be concerned about here. In addition, when we look at neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal, which is some of the, um, the medical complications that infants can have if they're exposed to opioids, we were starting to see a downtrend in neonatal abstinence, and then that increased again in 2020, and I'm sure we will see similar numbers for 2021 as well. So what does this mean for us? We know that perinatal opioid exposure has been increasing, and anyone who's interacting with pregnant people in the pandemic, we've, we've unfortunately, at least in my institution, seen more and more pregnant people who've come in and not had access to treatment. So we have to find a way to identify and engage pregnant people with substance use disorders, because we know if they engage in care, they are going to do better and their pregnancies are going to do better as well. And this is really a unique time because the overwhelming majority of pregnant people are going to have to engage with the health system. So it's often inevitable if you're going to deliver a baby, 99 out of 100 times, that's going to be in some sort of healthcare system. And so we do have a unique opportunity to engage people. Sometimes this is the first time people have had insurance coverage as well. But you can't treat what you don't know exists. And so I think finding individuals who are experiencing unhealthy substance use or substance use disorder starts with, with universal screening. It's been talked about before on some of these um, tool that has been who might have unhealthy substance use or substance use disorders. Um, so our initial goal with this is a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby but really also a healthy pregnant person. This should be done by anyone in the healthcare team who feels comfortable. You should ask an individual's permission to do this and also inquire in a place where it can be kept confidential. Um, screening is not catching somebody with a urine drug screen at their prenatal visit or when they come in to have a baby. And so we will talk a lot about that later on. Um, screening isn't confronting a patient saying, you know, I did a urine when you came in and I saw some marijuana in there. You know, this is really, really a bad, you need to stop this. You know, I really need to protect your baby. And so I just use that language, not because that's a good way to describe it, but that's often the communication or the discussions that we continue to see. Um, these are all the groups that recommend using a validated tool, either written or on an iPad or something you have a communication with. So it's addiction medicine docs, it's high-risk pregnancy docs, um, obstetrician, gynecologists, midwives, pediatricians, everybody knows that this is really the best way to engage individuals and identify use. Um, and I'm not gonna go over these in detail, but I provided a couple of the screeners that are most commonly used in obstetrics and have been validated. Um, really what we're trying to do is not to administer within five or 10 minutes a tool that's gonna tell us this patient has moderate opioid use disorder, not yet in remission. What you're trying to do is find the individuals who need to have a longer conversation um, about what's going on. And so these are, are just two of the tools that, that we use in our institutions. The whole goal of this is to quickly screen the entire population, that's why it's universally done, to have a brief intervention for those that need it to find out where somebody's at with their substance use, what is their motivation towards change, and to get those to treatment who need it right away, or to have a discussion about treatment for those who might consider it in the future. So why isn't this something that every single health system is using as just a standard part. You know, we ask about, you know, have you been exposed to COVID? You know, are, do you wear your seatbelt? Why aren't we asking about substance use? Um, and really that all boils down to something called mandatory reporting. And so what has historically been the case in Minnesota is that any perinatal substance use that's not part of a prescription needs to be reported. And that's kind of where we've been up until this past summer. Um, with the caveat that for reasons that have never been entirely clarified, um, alcohol and cannabis were never required to be reported in pregnancy, but anything else. So opioids, you know, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, cannabis, uh, sorry, not cannabis, but other substances. 
Um, so what we really found is this was a, a validated barrier to universal screening, and we had a lot of discussions um, within the OB community um, about just the problems related to this, especially from providers who come from other states where this wasn't the case. Um, and we were able to identify research that showed that in states that have mandated reporting, you actually had more patients who came in to have their babies and then had untreated substance dis use disorders at the time of delivery. And often it was such an uncomfortable or, or stigma-laden encounter at delivery that these individuals didn't engage in treatment. Um, and what we've actually found is that increased prenatal care increases, um, decreased prenatal care increases adverse pregnancy outcomes. So I'm not going to read this. I think everybody who works in any role with, with pregnant people is aware that, you know, immediately you were required if someone was using a substance for non-medical purpose to report them. So there was a um, telephone report in 24 hours and a written report, which was to follow um, when you kind of look at the details typically within uh, 72 hours in writing. <clears throat> um, and this is just kind of looking for context. Um, if you've ever been to ProPublica, they have a really great website that looks through all of the statutes, and you'll see more slides um, on this today talking about um, how we address substance use in pregnancy. And this is the pre-July 2021 states that required healthcare workers to report to authorities if they suspected that a woman um, or a pregnant person was using substances during pregnancy. Um, so what we know about mandatory substance use is that people leave care after the initial report, people are care fearful to even start in care, they don't wanna tell their providers what's going on. And to be quite honest, as a provider, I was afraid to ask because I had asked and had reported patients and had lost a lot of patients to follow up with, with truly tragic outcomes in the past. Um, and so we kind of started the conversation at ACOG and here in Minnesota and, and looping in a lot of other amazing groups, um, looking at the data on this. And, and this is a wonderful study from way back in 20, 2003 that actually compared um, pregnant people that had active substance use disorders, those who were in treatment, and then pregnant people who didn't have a substance use disorder and sort of stratified their outcomes based by how much prenatal care they got. And what they found is if you had regular prenatal care, even with ongoing substance use, you had a lower risk of preterm birth than those individuals who had substance use and didn't get prenatal care. And you actually had an improvement in infant birth weight. So actually just the process of coming to your doctor and continuing with your doctor or your midwife significantly improved the outcome for your pregnancy. And so I just want to take a quick second to call out all of the amazing teams here in Minnesota. Um, and I think that the change in law really was proof that advocacy works. Um, we had three years of bills introduced, hours and hours of letters and visits and, and testimony to our House and Senate and really statewide team collaboration. And ultimately, at the beginning of 2021, we were able to garner bipartisan support to change this statute. And so this is highlighting a statute change that went into effect in July of 2021, um, which really tells us that um, any healthcare professional or a social service professional who is mandated to report, so this is the mandated reporting we talked about before, is exempt if they are providing or collaborating with other professionals. So they don't have to be the one doing only the pregnancy care. If you're doing prenatal care, post-delivery care, or other healthcare services, including taking care of the patient's infant, um, you are no longer required to report. Now, this doesn't mean you can't report, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but you are no longer mandated to report at that first visit. Um, however, if the person does not get regular, um, the compromise that was reached in past thing, this legislation, you are still required to make that same report that we talked about earlier earlier because really allowed a lot of us interest at heart and I'm not just trying to you know before they go in um and a little bit about that requirement um, when you are caring for birthing people or they might allude to um, as, as they experience care in the state of Minnesota. 
Um, so I want to talk first about toxicology testing because this has gotten a lot of discussion, I think, both in the systems where I work as well as at other systems and at the uh, Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, toxicology testing is the different tests that we do to look for substances that a person might be exposed to. Most commonly, this is identified as urine drug testing. Sometimes people get blood alcohol levels. You can see hair samples, you can see nail clippings, but in general on labor and delivery for the pregnant person, it's a urine drug test. And for newborns, it's urine, meconium, and a lot of hospitals now are actually taking a segment of the umbilical cord because you can do the testing on that. And really the goal of this was to identify recent drug exposure and to help guide clinical care, both for the pregnant person or the recently pregnant person, and also to make sure that the baby isn't at risk of, of needing any extra care as well. However, Urine drug testing in particular is not a good way to tell if someone is using substances. There's a very short detection window for a lot of substances. Urine can't test for alcohol or tobacco. You can't tell if someone used one time or if someone used every day in their pregnancy, and that can have dramatic differences in how that baby is going to do and how that pregnant person is going to do. It's really not a trust building way. You know, if you ask a patient and they say, I'm not using anything, and you're like, cool, but your urine says you are, um, how is that helping them know that you want to care for them? Um, it's never been linked to intervention and referral, I think, again, because of this undermining of trust. And false negatives and positives are a very real concern. Um, and I think this study, which is older, but I think is really important, kind of highlights that, um, what we call the false negative. So this was you know, an anonymous testing of all new pregnant patients. And so they filled out an anonymous survey you know, what, do you, what have you been using? What kind of substances have you been using? It wasn't linked to their care or, or child protective service or reporting or anything like that. Um, and 19% of these patients said, yeah, I, I had actually used substances in pregnancy and, and here's what I used. But only 50% of those patients who said I have used recently actually had a positive urine drug screen. And so this is not picking up what I think the lawmakers intended it to do and what those who advocate for universal drug testing as a screen um, would intend it to do. So, so here it missed half the patients who were telling their caregivers, yeah, I, I've been exposed to substances in my pregnancy. Um, and this is just looking at states where testing is required. If, if you suspect drug use in pregnancy, there is state law that says you must test infants and new, newly preg you know, recently pregnant people. It's four states. And we're one of them. And this is the statute uh, here in Minnesota for toxicology testing. Um, and I acknowledge that this language is not person centered. A lot of this language is older, um, or perhaps, you know, not everybody is kind of at the place where, where we acknowledge some of the changes that need to happen. Um, but this is saying that a physician shall administer a toxicology test to a pregnant woman under their care or a woman within eight hours of delivery if the woman has or the person has obstetric complications that you say, you know what, these could be associated with using a controlled substance. So I kind of give you this list when I first started here in Minnesota, um, you know, I was working at a couple of health systems and they're like, here are all the toxicology criteria. So if any of these things happen, you need to do a urine toxicology test on your patient. And I don't know if you could remember these, I'm a little older, I really can't. Um, and so we got little cards that kind of use them. And as I talked to other colleagues in different systems, these are very similar criteria that were used across all of the health systems. And I won't go over all of them, obviously, it would take the rest of our, our webinar today. But um, as a group, the colleagues in my department um, and, and, and kind of throughout our system really started to talk about, are these indicative of substance use? And these are some of the criteria that started a conversation with us. If somebody's had a history of domestic or intimate partner violence two years ago, does that mean that they're using substances now? If they have visible tooth decay, isn't that more you know, attributable to a lack of access to you know, covered dental care and, and perhaps poverty and, and not uh, substance use? So we really started to talk about um, the inequities of screening in the way that they, that they were used in the system. Um, and really, there's been a lot of work in this in the last couple of years um, that, that I think is important to highlight. So um, this is four years of deliveries. This is some research that's come out in the last year, um, looking at a large urban, one of the top academic OB centers in the Midwest, where they didn't have any structured toxicology protocol. So people sort of decided if they should drug test a patient or not when they came in. Um, and so of all the patients that they tested, 35% of them actually had some sort of substance present. Now, I think it's important to call out the overwhelming majority of those um, were cannabis use. Um, and the only testing indication 
that actually was associated with a positive test was current or prior substance use. Not a lot of the ones that we tend to test a lot of patients for here, hypertension, preterm labor, preterm birth, placental abruption, or other fetal indications. Um, and I also want to call out that they specifically looked at the differences by I identified race and ethnicity. And I do want to acknowledge that some of the language used for identified race and ethnicity, specifically in, in census level and hospital admission data, um, is problematic. Um, in particular for this, um, they had identified um, individuals marked as Hispanic. Um, I have chosen to use the term Latinx to differentiate that. I know that that is also not really kind of the best word that, that could be used. So I want to acknowledge and, and open the opportunity if there's better language that I could use for that. But I think it's important to call out that when they looked at these individuals, these two groups of birthing people were four to five times more likely to be tested for indications that absolutely were not associated with illicit use. And this is looking at the percentage of individuals broken down by identified race or ethnicity um, who had no reason to have it done. The doctor and the midwife just ordered it. And you can definitely see um, that there are inequitable indications and performance of these tests. Um, and I do want to also identify that um, uh, there was no work specifically looking at our native or indigenous uh, birthing uh, people here. Um, we are doing similar work here in the state of Minnesota, so hopefully we'll have some, some similar information here in, in the time to come. So what's the intent of this statute? I mean, really, what we're finding is the actual result is that we probably have biased care with no imp improvement in birthing patient outcomes. I think that's what I experienced and my colleagues have experienced and, and hopefully within the next year or so, we'll have some data um, statewide to show you as well. Um, so also, why are we using, what is the, what is the goal of urine testing? Is this to identify those individuals with substance use? You know, really what we should be doing is again, that verbal written screening. This is again, that list of organizations that support verbal written screening. This is a list of organizations that support urine drug screening or any kind of toxicology screening to pick up substance use in pregnancy. There's crickets. There's not nobody who works in this sphere thinks that is the right way to identify patients who have substance use disorders. So it's not an appropriate way to screen for substance use. It can be used in ways that reinforce bias and structural racism. And I will identify that there are about five or six other studies that have been published recently also addressing very similar concerns, but it's a law in Minnesota. So, you know, what do we do? How can we limit its use with less inequitable, I'm not gonna say equitable criteria because I don't know if there are any that are truly equitable, um, but how do we comply with state statute? And really, how can we do what's the best thing for our patients is what we do as healthcare providers within the structure of the legislation. Um, and so what we've chosen to do, and, I, and in the interest of time, I'll kind of go over it quickly, is, is you know, we've had a group that's sort of focused on what are the obstetrical complications that might suggest a use of controlled substance? How, how can we kind of limit this but be in compliance with statute. And this is the um, criteria that actually um, went into use today in my system um, in our electronic medical records. So if individuals have, um, we did do the two that that study found um, predicted it. So either the patient tells you that they've had a, you know, substance use exposure in pregnancy or they are in a treatment program. And then the things that we know are associated with substance use, what we see individuals come into the emergency room with, altered mental status, respiratory arrest, a seizure that's not related to preeclampsia, a stroke or a heart attack or cardiac arrest. And so those are kind of the criteria that we're using for the pregnant person. And then also for newborns that present with withdrawal type symptoms or newborns that fall within the safe harbor or newborns in which their birth parent or their birth uh, person declined to be screened and they met the criteria. So I just want you to think about, you know, what criteria do your parent, patient's preferred systems use? Are we using standardized testing across the systems, which is really what I would love to see? Um, and really next, I always wanna think big. Um, I feel very inspired by the change in the, in the mandatory reporting. We need to change the law. Um, and really, again, the only indication associated with a positive test is a history of substance use. Um, and so, you know, we've a great team here, even on this webinar today, we have to come together in groups like this. We have to keep together and, and I think work, especially I would like to see this toxicology as, as one of the next discussions we have at a state level. Um, so I want to talk just about some other um, things that we bump up against legally, um, specifically related to involuntary treatment, uh, CAPTA and prenatal substance use, which I'm sure we hear a lot about. And then I want to talk about a more positive federal law um, called the Emergency Substance Use Treatment or 72-hour rule. So let's talk about declining treatment. Now, we know that there are some patients who aren't ready for treatment for a myriad of reasons, 
or they're ready, but they just social barriers don't allow them to. Um, and does the law in our state create pathways that actually prevent patients or pregnant patients um, from declining treatment? And the short answer is yes. And I wanna talk really quickly about two things that we have in the state, uh, emergency admission and civil commitment. And there are forms of this all over the country in every state, but they look a little different in their definitions depending on where you live. Um, so we're gonna talk first about emergency admission. Um, and so I've got some language from, from the statute here. Um, and that is, if you have an individual who is, is chemically dependent and in danger of harming self or others, um, an officer, and that's defined as a, a peace officer or a health officer, so really you know, a, a sheriff or a police officer or a physician, um, is worried about their harming themselves or, their, or others if they are not immediately detained. You can take this person into custody and what that word custody means looks different for different people. And you take them to an examiner or treatment facility. A lot of times these individuals are already at a facility. They are declining treatment. Let's say they disclose that they're using you know, fentanyl, but they're like, I don't, I don't wanna start buprenorphine. I don't wanna go into methadone treatment. Um, and, and the response will be put them on hold. You can hold someone for up to 72 hours for this reason, for an emergency admission. This does not include weekends, does not include holidays. They do need to be evaluated by some care, kind of healthcare provider within 48 hours and a court hearing is held as soon as possible. These have often been um, virtual for our patients um, just because they're here in the hospital or um, because of pandemic related issues. Um, so what I've seen happen numerous times, pregnant patient declines treatment and they are seen in Minnesota as either being a danger harming themselves or others. Now, if I have a patient who says I'm suicidal or has come in and recently overdosed and I'm worried that they are going to die, I have a conversation where I say, I cannot let you go. I am afraid you're gonna have a fatal overdose. I need to keep you. So this is not to say that placing a hold is not something you should do. But if placing a hold is because this patient doesn't want to do what I want them to do right now, whether they have very valid reasons or not, um, we define that as, danger of other harming their pregnancy. Um, so in some Minnesota hospital systems, if a patient has a miscarriage during this process, if a patient opts for a termination of pregnancy, the hold is lifted. So the question really is, who is emergency admission meant to benefit? Is it meant to benefit the patient? Um, and this is the language for the emergency admission. I won't go over that, but it's always nice to have that. Um, and then that transitions into a civil commitment. So after an emergency admission within this 48 hours, not counting holidays and weekends, you have a pre-petition screening and there's a petition to the court to commit the patient. This requires a written statement by a healthcare provider and that court hearing for commitment is within 14 days. So patients can be held for quite some time. Um, and I've got the link to that commitment there. Um, and when we specifically look at committing someone civilly for substance use during pregnancy. There are three states, all in the Midwest. We are one of them. I wanna call out Wisconsin. There's been a lot of press and a lot of court cases there by recently pregnant people. Um, a pregnant person in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin can be held against their will for their whole pregnancy if they decline treatment. The uh, fetus has a court-appointed guardian ad litem, so a, a court-appointed lawyer. Um, and then the patient in all likelihood will lose custody after birth for prenatal child abuse. Um, and I just want to talk about, there's been a lot of great studies coming out, not specific to pregnancy, but what is civil commitment? What does placing somebody on a hold do? And these are looking at what the patients think, what the data show on outcomes, and really what, what uh, addiction medicine physicians think of this. And what some of these data show are that those individuals who are subjective to treatment against their will are over two times more likely to die from overdose than those who went to voluntary treatment. So it's not actually helping them. It's making them more likely to overdose. 34% of patients reported relapsing to drug use the day they were released from civil commitment. And less than 20% of patients who were in civil commitment programs received medication. Now, it's not to say that medication treatment, and I'm specifically calling out methadone and buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, it's not to say that those are needed, but they should be offered. And in general, most of the time, more than 20% of patients will agree to that, if only to help with their withdrawal symptoms. Um, and even more concerning, 7% followed up with addiction treatment after release. So once they were no longer required to be in treatment, obviously these aren't patients who are coming in and, and seeking that on their own. And so these data are telling us this is harmful. And again, we don't have these data specifically for pregnant people, but we have these data. And this past year, in a survey of people like me, addiction medicine, board certified physicians, more than half of them said 
yeah, I think civil commitment is probably something we should be using. So this is a disconnect, I think, um, that's very concerning and kind of speaks to what we understand or maybe how good of a job we're doing about getting this research out. Um, so that's kind of what we use. And, and I don't want to go into a lot of more detail about that, more just to be familiar with what we should be thinking about. I also want to address um, a couple of federal laws. And so the first one is CAPTA. Um, this is a Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. This was first initiated in the early 70s um, with federal funding for states and tribal organizations to help set up prevention, assessment, investigation, prosecution, treatment, specifically related to child abuse. Um, so the intentions are, are very good. The funding is important. Um, they've also provided demonstration grants. And this act has been modified and amended and, and renewed as recently as 2019. <laughs> um, and really what most recently it's it's been amended to include is identifying infants with potential substance exposure and making sure that they are safe and well after they go home from the hospital. And this will involve, you will hear a lot of talk about plan of safe, car, plan of safe care. Um, and what this law also does is encourages mandatory reporting laws for child abuse. So states, there are financial incentives for states to encourage providers to report child abuse. Now, unfortunately in this state, substance use is viewed as child abuse or neglect. Um, so when we're talking about a federal law that encourages treatment of child abuse or child neglect, all of our patients who have substance use disorder are unfortunately gonna fall under the auspices of this federal law. And this is looking at the states. And again, all of this is, is very easy for all of you to access online. The states as of 2022 in which drug use during pregnancy was considered child abuse. This is very hard for me, knowing that this is a medical condition, much like diabetes, much like high blood pressure, for which pregnant people need treatment for themselves and for their pregnancies. Yet in this state, these individuals are being considered as guilty of child abuse. And looking at this, not only have they been identified as, as guilty of child abuse, the overwhelming majority of the United States since 1973, 45 states have prosecuted pregnant people for prenatal child abuse or ne neglect for exposing their unborn children to drugs. So just even looking at the stigma language that it, it, in this slide. Um, so this is not just something in Minnesota. This is a, a, a nationwide concern for, for our pregnant folks. Um, the last um, federal law that I kind of want to go over, kind of ending with a little bit more positive um, note today, is, is something called um, the emergency substance use uh, treatment. And this is something that I think really has the ability, especially now that we don't have mandatory reporting, to allow all of us who are facing patients in a clinic or in a hospital setting um, to start people in treatment. And, and what studies have shown time after time is if somebody comes in and they admit that they have untreated substance use disorder, they are going to do the best if they want treatment then they can get treatment then, not let me get you into a clinic next week. Maybe I can get you in, you know, the first, you know, first thing next month, but then. And so this is something that you will hear called the 72 hour rule. And there is a lot of misinformation and fear, often valid, about utilizing this rule. And this is a federal rule that the goal is to stabilize patients for those first three days to get them into treatment. It is not. Sally Smith, OBGYN, who has never worked in addiction medicine, saying, I am going to become the provider for your buprenorphine. It is, I am going to stabilize you for three days. I'm not going to prescribe you a medication. I'm going to give you a medication for up to three days, whether that's as an outpatient, whether that's in an inpatient setting, which is more often where it happens, to get you stable, to get you through your withdrawal, and to have a conversation about how you can get to effective treatment that's going to work for you. You do not need a waiver. And when I say waiver, there is a special license that you need to apply for from the DEA to use treatments such as buprenorphine, subutex, suboxone for patients with opioid use disorder. This is anyone who has a DEA license. So if you can give a patient a Percocet because they have a broken wrist, you can do this dis dispensation for three days. This includes pregnancy. Now in the non-pregnant patients, the individual actually has to come in and withdrawal. So this is specifically for opioid treatment. But a pregnant person can come in and say, I've struggled with fentanyl. 
I've been off fentanyl for about four days, but I'm really feeling like I'm going to use and I'm scared because I'm pregnant. They don't need to be in withdrawal. They just need to identify that they are concerned that they're going to start using non-prescribed medications or non-prescribed substances and you can start them on buprenorphine or methadone. If you're not in a methadone clinic, that's okay. You can do three days of initial stabilization to transition them to a methadone clinic. And, and I acknowledge that methadone clinic, that, that what's called an OTP or an outpatient treatment program, where methadone is, is administered and, and dispensed is a very unique situation that, that a, a lot of us don't have, but it doesn't mean we can't start that medication. This is the treatment exception. I would have everybody take a picture of the slide, copy it, put it in your phone, because often there'll be... Um, just miscommunications with other providers or with pharmacies, especially if there are new pharmacists, they just may not know that this is a thing. Um, but, but it's very clear that this is something that you can do. So the way I use this, the patient comes to labor and delivery with contractions. Turns out their contractions are actually a sim symptom of opioid withdrawal. I screen them. They screen positive for concern for substance use. We have a conversation. I, I don't have my waiver, but I have a DA license. And I start them on a medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder. I give them a medication in the hospital for three days, and I have them start working with my social work, my addiction medicine colleagues, and I get them into treatment. And this is just, again, I'm not going to go over it, but I had the opportunity to work with an amazing high school student three years ago um, who created this fantastic cheat sheet for all of the people in our institution for how to start these medications. It talks like about how to kind of how long it needs to be before they, they start on the medications, and that's kind of a whole nother um, conversations, some of the symptoms of withdrawal, and then really talks you through those three days, how you start buprenorphine. Very simple. We also have on this next slide, how you start methadone. So methadone is a little bit more nuanced. You might, the first few times you do this, having a colleague who's done it before, calling me, having a colleague in addiction medicine that you, you know, have attending some of our ECHO, additional ECHO programs, and I'll talk a little bit about mine um, later on, that talk through these individual cases can be very helpful. Um, and there are a lot of withdrawal medications that you can give patients during pregnancy that can help with the side effects of withdrawal as you're starting these medications. Um, so in summary, I think that, you know, we can celebrate our recent law change here. It's really, at least for me in these last eight months, dramatically improved that initial development of a patient-provider relationship. Um, there are additional statutes that you need to be aware of to guide care, um, and we have a lot of opportunity for improvement. There is so much work left to do for our patients and clients to really make this a medical condition that is as stigma-free as possible and allows individuals to get the care that's actually going to work for them. Um, and I just always have to have a plug that, you know, we, we can't do this alone. We got to do this together. You know, education for your colleagues, your friends, your neighbors, you know, tell them to watch this, tell them to, you know, talk to anybody who's kind of working in this space, Wayside is doing a great job advocating at the local level. And I think when you go to your elected officials, stories are so important. And that allows, you know, our elected officials to really know that they can make huge changes. Don't forget to vote if you can. Um, and maybe vote, run for office if you've got, you know, some, some great experience in this or, or, or have that time to, to dedicate to your community. Um, so what's next? What do we need to be focused on? I want all of you who looked at that slide before and are like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to sort of engage. I, I, I need to start having this conversation about making things better for, for pregnant people and their families. You know, the things that are kind of next on my list are how do we change toxicology screening requirements? How do we standardize those? Does, does the statute need to change? Do we need to be doing this at all? Um, how do we change protocols, practices, and perspectives when patients aren't ready for substance use treatment? Obviously, it's not civil commitment, at least based on the data that we have. Um, how do we prioritize pregnant patients to access and treatment? Something that Wisconsin does that's really great is if you're pregnant, you go to the top of the list. No, I acknowledge that that is fraught with problems as well, because if somebody has a miscarriage, they get bumped back to the bottom. Um, but I think that this is something that we should have a conversation about. Expansion of great programs like Wayside, supporting birthing people and families all across the state so that you can, this is easily accessible. Programs like Wayside that, and again, I'm, I'm not being paid by Wayside to plug it. I just, I've had some patients have really had great experience with having childcare, having educational programs. It's just so, that's what our pregnant people need is somebody to, to support them. Um, and really addressing this inaccuracy that a medical condition is a form of child neglect and abuse. If I have a patient with diabetes who comes in and is like, I'm not taking care of my diabetes, my blood sugars are really high, I know that's dangerous for the pregnancy, I know that they're at risk of, of a stillbirth from lack of optimal care for their diabetes. 
I'm not reporting them for prenatal child neglect and abuse. And substance use disorder is a medical condition just the same. And we need to start having that discussion in the same way. So I'm going to stop quick for questions. I have my email on here too. I'm always happy to engage um, in care for this. And then if it's okay, I just want to show a slide while we're, we're going through the um, questions and just give people time. Um, I do uh, work with Project ECHO at Hennepin Healthcare. Um, and we had done a prior six month program on perinatal substance use. And we will be starting this again next month. It's going to be the second and fourth Tuesdays from 1215 to 1:15. This is going to be really great because the first time we've had an intersection of substance use treatment and mental health care. So Katie Thorson is an amazing psychiatrist who works with the Red Leaf program in perinatal mental health. And what this program does is we give a real brief education. And this isn't just for doctors and midwives. This is for anyone who wants to come. It's free. We will have CME probably starting in the summer. Um, and the really cool part is you can bring a case. So you're like, hey, I had this case and all the identified, no, she was 30 years old and this is what happened. And I don't know if that's what we should have done. Should we have done this? Or how could I have gotten some other resources? And you have this free consult to talk through what you can do in, in the future. And sometimes even to talk to a patient you have that you're going to see the next day. And so it's just really been an awesome way to network. Um, I've met some really fantastic people working with them. So I want to encourage all of you, if you go to the Project ECHO site, you sign up specifically for the perinatal substance use um, series. And I would love to see all of you there next month. Um, so I want to thank everybody. And then I will um, turn it over to our team uh, for some questions. Thank you, Cresta. That was a great presentation. Very informative. Thanks for sharing that echo. It sounds really good as well. Um, we're going to turn it over to uh, Nicole. Uh, we're going to do a quick q and A. I I think we have time for about one or two questions um, before we close things up. So I'll pass it to my coworker, Nicole. Great, thank you. What an awesome presentation, Dr. Jones. We so appreciate you for sharing so much valuable information. Uh, we do have our first question from Linda. She says, Dr. Jones, do you find that pediatric colleagues tend to support your position on testing and reporting, or do you see a different stance in peds? Yeah, that is an awesome question. And I think what is always important when you, when you talk about that, because we've had a lot of conversations in our system, these new urine drug screening criteria that we have have been universally endorsed by all of our pediatric colleagues um, at the university and also the OBE team and the midwifery team. My goal, I see these women for the rest of their life or the rest of their reproductive life or these pregnant patients. My goal is I want to do something that's going to help your pregnancy, but is going to position you for a life of recovery if that's what you want. My pediatric colleagues have a very different lens. And so what we've done is sat down and said, here are the data that I see. And then they've had the opportunity to say, here's my perspective. And I, I think the biggest concern is that these changes in how we screen would actually miss babies that needed care and were going to harm babies in the long run. And the data that we have so far do not suggest that that is the case, but it is definitely, it's easy for me to go, oh, well, pediatrics thinks that I don't care about these babies. And it's, you know, we're so siloed so often. And we just sat down and I went to the pediatrics said, what are the concerns that you have? And then highlighted my concerns. Um, and it was really inspiring to see how easily we came to a compromise and consensus on what was best for both. And I think it's just that we always want to advocate for who's ours. I want to advocate for that pregnant patient above all things. They want to advocate for the baby above all things. We can actually advocate for both and change things for, for better community care. But that is a great question, it comes up a lot. Thank you so much. Also, our next question says, how do you think implicit bias impacts the screening process and testing? Do you think implicit bias training is helpful? I would say 100% bias affects the screening. And we see that from that from those studies out of Northwestern is when you look at people who got a test just because I thought they needed the test. And if you look at who uses substances and you look at the percentage of individuals that would develop a substance use by identified race and ethnicity, it is the same everywhere. So we should have the same amount of screening, the same amount of positive screening, and we don't. And that means someone's coming in and, you know, I don't want to get political, but I blame a lot of this on the war on drugs that came out when I was a kid. You know, it was this, you know, 
we think cocaine in specific groups of birthing folks is harming their babies. And it never did. And then you had a different patient who came in who also used cocaine and got a free pass. And so we have so much structure that has to be broken down to say, we're starting at the baseline. Everybody here is at risk of this. And we have to acknowledge though, that somebody comes in and they're like, you know, she just has bad dentition. I think she's on meth. Mm. No, (laughs) she might have insurance. It doesn't cover dental care. And she's not more likely to be on meth because she hasn't. So I, I think it's, it's, it's that sort of discussion and language and then constantly saying, well, that's an interesting thing to say. Why do you think that way? What do you think's going on in her life? And, and um, the question about implicit bias training, I think it's acknowledging there's a lot of different trainings that are out there. There's a lot more work to do. You know, I have gone through the amazing work that Rachel Hardiman has done. Um, we're so lucky to have her here in Minnesota. Um, and I think expanding that type of training to perinatal substance use and really digging into we all judge, we judge safe and unsafe. That's how we are as human beings. But taking that pause to say, I am judging incorrectly based on my lived experience and trying to break that down and learn together. So it is, it is a huge problem. And I'm hoping we will have more work in that space in the years to come here in Minnesota. Thank you. We have a question now from Kendra. It says, we've heard frustrations from perinatal providers that they build trust with patients, but by not reporting, only to lose that trust when the patient is drug tested by someone else at delivery. Any advice for the perinatal provider in this situation? It is building the structure from the ground up and it's gonna take time. It's getting all of us, those in the inpatient, those in the clinic, everybody understanding where these patients are coming to us and how what, what works. And a lot of it is just, you know, we, I, I've dealt with stigma in every clinic I've worked with and, and just saying to, you know, a student or saying to the nurse or saying to one of my colleagues, I just want you to come in while I talk to this patient and listen to the story mm-hmm. yeah. and listen to the damage that happened to them when they felt safe. And then they went in and someone drug tested them without their permission. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is something that I think is going to take a state effort to set a new ground on what works and what doesn't work and, and, and getting past that fear of, but what if I miss this person? What if I don't catch this person? Is their baby going to be okay? Um, so it's, it is a, a nuanced conversation. And I will say to patients, look, there are going to be, there's going to be stuff that comes up. I need you to use me as an advocate for you. I can't keep you safe all the time from the what's out there in the world. You might get a drug, a drug screen. And we need to have a conversation about that when it happens. And I also give them the, the power to say, Somebody's using the wrong language, even if it's me, it isn't their job to call me out, but they can call me out. And I've had a patient say, I don't really like that word that you use. Could you say this instead? And that is not me being a bad doctor. That is the right kind of relationship to have. That's so powerful. That's really powerful what you said. And it just made me think of too, um, coming from the institution you are, the University of Minnesota with, right? Students are coming through being changed in, in multiple disciplines, just to know that this work is happening and being shared. Um, we have a question from Megan. Do you know what the ramifications for pregnant people or babies who test positive are? I hear a lot that CPS does a quick check and then closes the case. This is mostly for cannabis use. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Megan, and that and that comes up a lot. So um, every county is required to have what's called a plan of safe care for each um, pregnant person or, or each newborn that has substance exposure. But those plans vary different by county and resources. I have no doubt that those lim- resources were more limited during the pandemic with funding and access. Um, and there isn't one answer for if you test positive for cannabis, this is what's going to happen. I think it's different all over the all over the place. Um, I think there is a huge disconnect, and, and we see this all the time, myself included. I don't know what happens with you know CPS writ large, and I think that CPS doesn't know what happens in my clinic, right? So so we need to get to a place where we're all at the table. You know, can we have a conversation with leaders from CPS from all the different counties to say, what am I doing that's frustrating you? What, am, what do I hear my patients say as a challenge when they work with CPS? How can we make this better? When I worked in Wisconsin, I would sit in the room with the patient and I would, we would call CPS together and say, this patient lives in Milwaukee County. She's just getting into treatment. We're not there yet. Can you identify who's going to be her caseworker? And let's talk to them. 
Sometimes their caseworker would come with them to the clinic visits. It was amazing. It gave that patient the ability to be part of the narrative. So it wasn't me calling CPS in this black box later where they didn't know. And so a lot of states are, are trying to do that where being more proactive when the patient's ready to say, you're going to know everything I say. I know that this is the you know, work they've done at Hennepin as well, um, is talking together with, with the providers, um, which is awesome. Thank you. And Susan posted a resource in the chat um, that is a collaborative working around perinatal quality collaborative. Um, so she wants to make sure that everyone sees that there. And then this would be our last question from Linda. It says, um, do you have any data on the harms versus the benefits of child protection involvement in families reported for substance use in pregnancy? That is a great question. And I, um, I actually don't. <laughs> so this is one of the, one of the areas where I do not pretend to be an expert in any way. I have not done a lot of examination of the research related to um, outcomes with, with child protective services. I definitely will after this. Um, the data that I have is simply, and I think that pretty much all of us here today know that um, the harms to the recently pregnant person, the, the birthing mom, and the baby with uh, separation. Um, so I think there is good data that reunification helps everybody. Um, but I don't know specifically about um, child protection. I think it would be hard to do a lot of that study because it's so different in so many places. When you have Project Child, when you have Mothers First, it, it's a very different environment when you're when you're gaining that partnership at, you know, 20 weeks versus someone showing up at birth and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, so I think that it's it, it can be helpful, um, but it's a lot of it is how do we all work together? But I don't have those data uh, with me today, so apologies for that. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for your time today. Thank you for sharing your email. And Dr. Jones, is it okay if we are, share the slides with participants who might be interested in a PDF form? Absolutely. So I will share the finalized slides. Apologies that they were a little different. I just wanted to add some, some additional sure. uh, questions that had come up on legislation, um, but I'm happy for those to be shared with everybody um, and you know, encouraging anybody from any system who wants to, to, to watch this and, and follow up with me. I'm welcome to welcome to do so. Wonderful. And so we also just want to recognize that um, this um, echo has been brought to us by a relationship with the Minnesota Department of Human Services and SAMHSA, a SOAR grant. And we appreciate everyone attending. Um, we have tried to place registration for upcoming um, echo that will happen on March 23rd, which will be Pregnancy, Food, and Eating for Two by Dr. Sharon Rahman. Um, as well as you can always go to our landing page for our maternal infant health um, at Wayside um, to see more up and coming, um, you know, education series around maternal and infant health. And as Dr. Jones shared theirs as well, um, we look forward to possibly partnering um, to share more information together uh, for participants. Thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.